Today is March 13, 2014, and we are interviewing Niles Conklin at the Effingham DAV Club. Niles was born 11-6-1946. My name is Cheryl Walker, and I'll be interviewing Niles. Um, Mr. Conklin, could you state for the record what war and branch of service you served in? I served in the United States Navy and during the Vietnam War. And what was your highest rank? I was a second class petty officer, which would have been an E-5. And that was in the Navy? Correct. Okay. Would you like to tell us um, your history, your story about your service time? Yeah, I guess I can. Okay. <laughs> uh, well, I joined the Navy in November of 1964, and uh, it was during the draft year, years, and uh, they let me wait until January of 1965 before they come and got me and sent me to boot camp. And I went to boot camp in San Diego, California, and uh, after boot camp, I was sent to Pensacola, Florida for CT training uh, and the CT stands for communications technician and after that I was transferred or sent to Seattle, Washington and I was assigned to the USS Ramsey which was a destroyer escort guided missile and it was number two in its class it was a brand new ship that was actually being built in Seattle by Lockheed Shipbuilding. And uh, the ship was only half done. So for the next two years, I stayed at uh, Sandpoint Naval Air Station in Seattle, and that's where I was barracks. And I worked on that ship in the shipyard each day, basically doing paperwork. Uh, uh, progress reports, defects if you found them, or if you seen something you didn't agree with what was going on, you would write these things down and then you'd turn these in. And that that really was a Monday through Friday job, about eight till five, and they bust us from the base to the shipyard, and then they'd bust us back. And so that was for two. I'm trying to think of the years. 65 until later in 77 I'm thinking August maybe of 77 well the ship was commissioned which now it becomes a United States war vessel and then we traveled down the west coast like doing maneuvers to make sure everything on this ship worked properly and we went to Long Beach and we went to Los Angeles, San Francisco, we went to San Diego and the whole time you're doing maneuvers off the coast of California. Uh, I'm trying to thank you. Uh, once the ship was accepted by the Navy then it was commissioned as a US warship and we really left, I think it was in, I'm thinking February of 1968, and we went to Vietnam. And we spent, I'm not sure, six or eight months off the coast of Vietnam uh, doing guard duty for the aircraft carriers and uh, came back in November and uh, I don't know. Anyhow, my duties aboard this ship were visual signaling, which dealt with Morse code and flags and the light, like if you see the old war movies and you see the light flashing, reading that light and communicating back and forth. And it's more or less Morse code. The light, you know, you can hear the sound or you can see it, you know. And that's what my job was. And then I studied a little bit in navigation, which is how to get from one place to another on a ship. But those were my duties aboard that ship. Okay, I have a question for you. Okay. Okay. 
being on a newly commissioned ship, what was that like? Oh, it was nice. It was to start with, you become a, they call it a plank owner. So you, you get papers that tell you, you were one of the original crew. And before you go aboard the ship, when it's new, you're, it's, you're in a pre-commissioning, it's called. So you're part of getting that ship ready to become a U.S. Navy warship. And then you become a plank owner when the ship is commissioned. And it's, I mean, you got to realize that back in those days, there wasn't a lot of ships that had air conditioning. Ours did. Uh, it had a lot of the modern things that today, they wouldn't be so modern, but they were in, in 1968. And it was... I mean, it was brand new. It was like driving a new car, you know. I don't know what to say. It just, it was, it was an honor to be aboard a brand new ship. So. Do you still have your plank owner? Oh yes, yes. I have all the paperwork. I have my hat, and it says, you know, USS Ramsey, plank owner. And that's to people in the Navy. They know what that means, you know. A guy in the Army wouldn't know much about it, but. So, uh, now based it well, I came back to the States in late November of 68, or maybe it was early December, I'm not sure. And then I transferred into the United States Naval Reserves. And I stayed in the reserves uh, for... I think another six years until 1975 and during that time I I went to I got to go to Hawaii when they were going to recover one of the Apollo spacecraft now we were on the other end of the recovery area so we didn't see it come down but we got to steam by the aircraft carrier that was carrying the capsule and got to see it setting up on the deck. And I'm not sure if that was in 75 or 76 when that happened. And then I got to go to the Bahamas one year. These are on your two week cruises. I went to the Bahamas and I went to Seattle once and I went to Spain for three weeks on these cruises, which are you part of your requirement. Every year you have to take a cruise to keep your duties current. And I stayed in the reserves until 1975 and then, I don't know, decided to get out. So that's kind of my whole Navy career. Um, okay, so we talked about being a plank owner and is the, is the ship still, is the USS Ramsey still in commission? No, it isn't. It's not in commission. The Navy took it in 2000, I think, and used it as a target and sunk it. And the United States Navy jets flew at this ship and shot at it for practice. You know, more or less it was a target, you know, then. And uh, at the end of the day, the ship hadn't sunk yet. So another Navy vessel shot a harpoon missile into the side of that Ramsey, and it sunk. Like in 10 minutes, it was gone. And they sent us a video of that ship sinking. It's hard to watch. And we also have the coordinates and it's off of Northwest Hawaii, where it lays now in the ocean. But uh, it's hard to think that they sank it, but it's better than getting sold to another country and turned into a generator plant. So at least the United States Navy is the one that had to sink it. I mean, that's the way I look at it. It's hard to watch something that you were part of. That's a big part of your life. And then to watch it sink in the ocean, you know. So yeah, that that would be hard. Yeah, I mean it's like losing someone that. I mean it really is. Yeah, so. to, because 
going to, going being a plank owner, having your name up on on that ship for how many years, and then knowing that it went down. Yep. And yeah, that would be hard. That would be difficult. Yep. It it is, and it, it took me. I'll tell you what. They sent me the video of the ship sinking. And it took me several years before I could actually put that in a computer and watch it because I just didn't want to watch it sunk. And when you view it, it actually shows the Harpoon missile and it shows it and it has it like in a circle so you see it coming. Then you see the explosion and then you see it go down. Yeah. So. That would be like the end of the career. Yeah. The, yep. the end of your, the life. Yeah, it's, you know, it's something you wished today that that ship was still around so I could go visit it, even if it was in dry dock somewhere. Yeah, if it was you retired. Know, correct. Yep. And I don't know why, but because there's a lot older ships around, but they sunk this one. Hmm. So. Hmm. Interesting. Now, doing Morse code and watching signals, and you said, you know, you referred to like in the movies. I want to go back to that. Well, it's, yeah, okay. And as it's depicted in the movies, is, is it truly depicted correctly in the movies? Yes. It is. Yes, and if you like in a movie do you know how you will see actual war films of the actual like battle like you know most movies they may be hollywood but they'll show pieces especially years ago they would show pieces of real film of ships out in the ocean and i may not be as good as i once was but I can read those lights. I can tell you what those characters were that they were sending. You know, they don't show enough of it for you to get a message, but you can pick out the letters like H or K or whatever, and the flags are usually depicted correctly in them old, not so much a Hollywood movie, but when you see the old film of the old ships, uh, that's, you know, and it's, so all this time, that has stuck with you? Oh yeah, most of it. It's hard to, you know, something that you did all those years. I, I did it from, oh, I don't know, 65 to 75. So something you did it every day, in a sense, for 10 years, you don't easily forget, you know, mm -hmm. it's... Now, do they still use that? No. They don't? No, there's, t <laughs> there's too much advanced actually the job i had no longer exists in the navy a signal you you know a signalman is no longer and a lot of your navigation they still have what is called a quartermaster and he does the navigation and a lot of that now is a lot easier because of gps you know it was hard work to position yourself in the middle of the ocean when i was in and now you just ask the satellite where you're at and it shows you so, what type of planes came on board your ship none this no. was a just this was not a real this wasn't like an aircraft carrier this destroyer escort guided missile was approximately 414 foot long and 44 feet wide so it, it's not considered a huge ship i mean it's not little by any means it had I think we had around 395 men on board that ship when it went to Vietnam. And uh, a helicopter could land on what was called the fantail, which is the back of the ship, if it had to. And some of the bigger helicopters couldn't. But we in Vietnam, we actually refueled a few helicopters. They came to us in trouble without enough fuel. And we would literally take a hose and they would hook onto it, take the hose up to their helicopter while they were hovering over our ship and refuel their helicopter. 
and then they'd fly off. And they were glad to get some gas. See, our ship used, it was new and modern, and instead of the old type of fuel that they used in the old World War II ships, ours used uh, jet fuel is what it burned. So when a helicopter, or you know, if it needed fuel, we could provide it to him because we had the right fuel. So I have a few pictures at home of them hovering on and getting fueled, which they couldn't land because they were too big a helicopter, you know, uh, the ones they used in Vietnam. So. Um. Did you, um, did you, you say you were off the coast of Vietnam. Did you take any R&R &R over in Vietnam? No, no. The R&R &R that we did, they always had us go. Uh, we went to Japan for a few days. Yakuska, Japan was one of the ports we went to for R&R, &R. and Sasebo, Japan, and then we were in a huge, well, it was a typhoon over there, it was called Typhoon Mary, and that would have been in 68, and we sustained a lot of exterior damage to the ship because of that storm, and we went to the Philippine Islands. Subic Bay was a Navy port, and that's where they repaired the ship, fixed the things that were broke or whatever, and then we went back to Vietnam. But uh, I'm trying to think. We went to uh, R&R was just like a few days, or maybe three or four days, wherever you went. Because the ship, you know, it wasn't like you could send a group of men somewhere and let them stay there a week. The ship was needed. So I, we went to Hong Kong, China once, which the British at the time owned that. They kind of leased it or whatever, but the British were in charge of that port and now it's returned to China. But I think that's, I think that's the three places that, and when we went to the Philippines, that was for repairs, but it's still kind of like R&R &R because there's no fighting going on there, so you could go into town and have a Pepsi. <laughs> so. Um, did you have plenty of supplies on the ship? Oh, yeah. They were well. The ship was modern, and like I said, it had bigger... Oh, refrigeration units and freezers. But we did run out of supplies at times when we stayed out too long. Like, you'd run low on fresh milk because, you know, you can only keep milk so long. And, uh, but we stayed in what was like a carrier task group. So there was ships out there that when you really needed something, they would bring it to you. You would go alongside of another ship and they would bring that over to you like on a wire or a helicopter would deliver food, set it on the fantail of the, of the ship, like in a big cargo net, like you may see, and then they would just unhook that net, and then there's the food. Well, then the men would take that food below, and after so many of those cargo nets, then they would bundle them up, and the helicopter would come and get those. And, and sometimes that came from the aircraft carrier. You know, you weren't sure where that, where they got the food, but when you needed fuel, you would go alongside of a tanker, like a ship that just refueled ships, or the aircraft carrier, because it had the kind of fuel we needed. You know, because all their jets burnt that jet fuel. So, but for the most part, I mean, we didn't run out, just rarely. You know, it would, if you stayed out too many days, I think the longest we stayed out was 30, uh, 30, I don't know, 30, 30 some days. And if you ever seen land, you were seeing the coast of North Vietnam when you did see land, so. They say that 
the Navy has the best food. Do you agree? I agree. We had a tremendous cook. Um, you know, well, we had several, but we had one that was a great guy. He was a good cook, and no complaints when it comes to food. <laughs> so, I, you know, the, the guy stayed a friend of mine for years. I've lost contact with him now, but I still have three of my shipmates that I am friends with today, and we communicate, we visit each other. I just spent a week with one of them in uh, Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, last summer. We've just stayed close, you know, it's... That's great. One lives in Pennsylvania, one lives in Texas. <laughs> but I had more than that, but through the years, you know, things just... You lose contact with people. But I still have three of them, that, and we're close, you know. The one in Pennsylvania, him and I did the same job, so we worked together every day for two or three years. So, you know, just got to be good friends, you know. Actually, I f almost feel like I'm closer to them than people I went to high school with. Because we worked together, we served together, we, you know, and they'll always be close to me, you know. So, how did you stay in touch with your family? You really didn't. Letters. And you would, <laughs> letters, you would write a letter, and let's say you wrote a couple a week. Well, uh, my wife, because I was married before I left, uh, she would get two or three letters at a time, or four. I would send them separately, but when they got to her, she'd get three or four of them. So we come up with the idea of numbering them. Number one in the corner, and then number two, and three, and four, and five. So that when she got them, she would read them in that order, you know. Which, you know, I don't know how much, <laughs> they probably sounded like, she still has all of them. She lets me remember that. <laughs> so. But we numbered them so she would get them and know which one was wrote first, you know. And of course, a lot of times over there you weren't allowed to tell what you were doing exactly or maybe exactly where you were, even in a letter. You weren't supposed to do that, you know. So. Did you have any entertainers come to visit you? Or did you see any entertainers? No, Bob Hope was over there. And uh, I never got to see him, but I, I, uh, he was in that area and he, you know, entertained troops aboard the ships. But of course, you know, he can only be on one ship. He can't be on a, our task group had, uh, I think 12 ships in it. It had an aircraft carrier. And then there was six of one of these destroyers that stayed with that aircraft carrier all the time. There was a submarine. Oh, and I got to spend a week on that submarine, too. So. What was that like? Oh, different. Totally different life. I mean, those guys are amazing that serve on a submarine. Everyone knows everyone's job. And I went there to help train some of their quartermasters, navigation and signaling, okay? Because they don't do much of that. But, you know in order to train them a little so that they could stay up with it, they sent me there for a week. And we went in a whale boat from my ship to that submarine. And then we went down, stayed under the water for a whole week. And I asked them, I said, is there anything I'm supposed to do? Well, those guys said, don't touch nothing. <laughs> you know, they knew what they were doing. They said, nope, you don't have to do anything. Just do your training, but don't touch anything. Because they... A, a, a sound goes off and they open a valve or close a valve or well they said don't they don't want me touching nothing you know it was kind of hilarious because they said oh don't mess with nothing but it was and I actually got to look at our ship through the periscope the captain let me come up and look through the periscope at our ship out there in the water which you know there's things that 
somebody would never get to experience, you know, and so. Were you glad to see the light of day? Well, you know, I spent most of my time aboard a ship outdoors, out in the open part of the ship. So it was, it felt closed in. It felt like you were, you know, for me, because I'm used to being out all the time. And when I was in there, you, you would just, it was like being in a box that you couldn't get out of. You know, you just stayed there. And it was just for a week. But I enjoyed it. I, They live a different type of life. They, they eat differently. They are served like country style when they eat their meals. Instead of going through a chow line like we did, they bring a bowl of potatoes and a bowl of corn and... And actually, and the submarine don't move hardly at all. When you're under the water, you feel like you're just sitting at home. It doesn't have that movement that you go through on a, like the destroyer. It moved around a lot. And then that typhoon that we were in, it moved a whole bunch. I mean, it. I I think that's the only time I felt some fear because that typhoon was throwing us around like we were a toy in the middle of that ocean. And uh, you just, and we were in that for 72 hours. So that's, you just wonder, boy, I hope they built this thing good <laughs> because it, I mean, it was in the water, out of the water, water come over the top of the ship. It's, it was scary in a sense, you know, and no one was allowed outside of the ship during this period, you know, that, and that's the one that did all the damage to it. But like I said, a destroyer escort guided missile ship is not a real big ship in its sense, you know, compared to like, well, most aircraft carriers would be four or five times longer. And, you know, I don't know how much wider, but a lot, so. Did you have any siblings that were in the service? Yes. At the same time that you were? Yeah, well, I had two brothers. They both served in the Navy. One of them served, no, not while I was in. When I got out, well, I was still in the reserves. But while I got out of the regular Navy and went into reserves, I had a brother that went and served in the Navy and he worked on F-4 jets, and he went to Vietnam for a year and a half, and he was, uh, they call them aviation boats and mates. They help maintain not the engines, but the overall condition of a F-4 jet, and that's what he did. And, and I had a younger brother that, Oh, in the early 70s, I'm thinking 72 or 3, he served in ADAC, Alaska, in the Navy, and then served aboard a amphibious assault ship until he got out. So I had two brothers, and they both served in the Navy. You know, my dad served during World War II on a battleship. So the whole family, my, bro my dad had quite a few brothers, uh, well, 11 of them, and most of them served in the Navy during World War II. One of them served in the Army Air Corps, and he was killed in the war. So, hmm. the family's been in the service, you know, I mean, military-wise. Do you recall the day that your service ended? The day I got out of the regular Navy? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Where were you at? I was in Long Beach, California. And it was January, okay, uh, it was January the 9th, I guess I got out. And I could have left the ship at midnight, in a sense. I could have got up, and any time after midnight, I was done. Signed the papers and left. And I left the next morning. I just thought, you know, what the heck, one more night ain't gonna matter. So I got up the next morning and walked down the pier to, you know, to leave. And uh, 
I remember looking back at that ship and I thought, you know, that's been three years of my life right there. So, I mean, it's, just, <laughs> it's hard to describe how you feel about that thing. That's your home, that's your, you know, that's all your friends. They're all right there and you're walking away. So Now was your wife at home here? Yeah, I when I went to Vietnam, I sent her back here to live with my parents. And I had a little son that was mm, about two years old. And I thought anything goes wrong, anything happens, I know that they'll take care of them. And so they lived back here in actually in Mount Olive, Illinois, and uh, until I got out. So, yeah, my son didn't know who I was when I come home. <laughs> of course, you know, I'd been gone for three quarters of his life, you know. Of course, he liked Grandpa better. It didn't take long, though. Oh, no, no. But that's part of, you know, that's part of the life you live when you go away for those, you know, a year or whatever, so. Um, what did you do when you got home? What did I do? I didn't do too much. <laughs> I, I don't know, really. My wife had a good job working for the Secretary of State of Illinois, Mr. Paul Powell. <laughs> Anyhow, so I just kind of took it easy for a few months. And then when I did start working, I worked a few jobs I didn't care for. They put me in like a factory, you know, I didn't like it. I didn't like being cooped up. And then I started working construction and I loved it because I was outdoors again. You know, I spent, you know, as a kid, I worked on farms. I'm outdoors. The Navy, most of my job was outdoors, you know, out on the open part of the ship. So I just didn't like being cooped up. I quit a few jobs. And, but then when I worked construction, that was something I really enjoyed. And I did it for, oh, I don't know, three or four years. And uh, then I started driving a truck. I drove a truck for two and a half years for just different companies, you know, whoever would hire me. And then I came to work for Yellow Transportation here in Effingham in 1974. And I worked for them for 34 years and then retired. But I drove a truck, I think, 37 and a half years total. But I always liked construction, and I've helped my two sons build a house you know, years ago, but I just like that kind of work, you know, I like, but driving a truck was a good, it was a good living, it was a union job, it was, you know, back in the day, the benefits were good, you had medical care for your family, I have no complaints, I, I draw a pretty good retirement, so I'm happy. <laughs> But I like being outdoors. I don't like being, even now, I don't sit around the house much. I'm always outside, unless it's too cold. So. Now, did you join any veteran organizations? Yes. Uh, I joined the VFW when I came home from Vietnam. I joined it, I think, in 1970. So I've been with them. And the post here in town, 1769, I'm the commander there. I have been for two years. And I also belong to the American Legion here in town. And they've asked me to join the DAV here, which I haven't done yet, but I probably will. So I belong to two of them. And before the year's out, I'll belong here at the DAV. So... Is there anything else you'd like to say? Well, I think we covered a lot. <laughs> okay. Well, at this time, I'd like to say thank you for serving our country and also thank you for the interview and for allowing me the pleasure of being able to be the one that interviewed you today. I don't know if I could just add a little bit. Yes. 
I think our country needs to really keep in mind the way we came home from Vietnam and the way we were treated. And I didn't say anything about it, but I think it should be mentioned. If this is going to be history, we weren't treated well when we come home. And a lot of Vietnam veterans to this day feel extremely strong about that. They won't join, they won't get involved because of that. And I don't think that should be forgotten. And I, I, I like the way they're bringing the veterans home now. They're showing them the respect they deserve for what they did, you know. But I think that's important. So, and I appreciate you thanking me. I just thought I better. I was not going to say something about that, but we came home, and I can tell you so. We came home, and now you're coming on a ship. You're coming up, and you can see the United States, and you're pulling into a port where you're going to be for the next several months. And to see people standing on the shoreline with signs calling you what things you don't want to repeat. Signs telling you how much they hated you for what you had done. You had just served your country. It was hard to take. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. enough said, I guess. Okay. Well, thank you. All righty. Well, thank you.